Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. Today we're going to talk about precision feeding and looking at nutrient variation. In terms of introduction, really what is precision feeding? And I'm sure you can expand these definitions beyond what I have listed, but I have listed three. One, provide a consistent ration, both in terms of physically and chemically, to the dairy cow. Another uh, precision feeding definition would be a consistent flow of nutrients through the rumen and the digestive tract to provide nutrients to support the various needs for the high-producing dairy cow. And then thirdly, another one would be remove a variation from the field to the feed bunk and to the bulk tank. And certainly that's the one that we are going to zero in on today. We look at uh, this drawing by Noel Leatherman, looking at the two different ways of hitting a target. Precision would be on the right side. You can see that the, the three shots are fairly closely clumped. They may or not, not be on the bullseye, where accuracy would be you're in the bullseye with a little bit more variation or lack of precision. In our feeding world, we'd like to have both of those in our feeding programs. So is there a cost when we lack precision? And I looked at just four different examples. One would be a waybacks. For example, if I have a 4% wayback, which would equate to probably about a kilo of feed or about two, two and a half pounds of feed per day, that could cost us anywhere from 30 to 35 cents per cow per day. Again, if we have a change in dry matter uh, in terms of corn silage, a shift in the dry matter, uh, and cows are being fed uh, seven kilograms of dry matter, that could cost us 10 or 12 cents per day. Shrink loss is another lack of precision, which means feed never get into the cow. That would be another 64 cents. And if we overfeed, for example, a half a kilo or a pound of protein supplement, this could cost us 24 to 30 cents a day. So certainly there are cost factors built into this, and we didn't even look at lost milk production potential or maybe indirectly some impact on reproductive performance. The basis of this uh, discussion is going to be a paper presented by doctors Bill Weiss and Norman St. Pierre from The Ohio State University trying to make sense of feed composition data within farm variation. And it's a beautiful set of data that you can study at your leisure as we go through it today. The importance of knowing variation because it certainly will affect how we build and formulate rations. Second of all, it will have an economic impact on the ration itself and how much of feed and feed ingredients we put in. Next, we need to know what type of a sampling and analysis schedule should we have for the feed. And certainly we know that if any of these things are incorrect, then we can have an impact on productivity and the health of the cow. So certainly as they listed goals for an optimal sampling and analyzing schedule is to certainly try to minimize cost. And of course we can sample too frequently running up our feed testing bill because we don't need to test quite that aggressively. Or to the other extreme is we don't test frequently enough and feeds are variation varying quite a bit and as a result we don't pick up on that variation and make adjustments in the feeding program. And certainly we know that all feeds are not the same. Some require much more consistent testing where others may not require it. You'll see when the day is done on this presentation that I won't give you the official answers, but something you'll have to consider on your dairy farm or working with your dairy clientele. Two measurements we'll look at. This is my favorite standard deviation. Uh, this just shows how much variation there is from an average. Uh, a low standard deviation means that uh, there's very little variation going on. You can see the other famous bell-shaped curve. And of course, the peak of the bell-shaped curve would be the, the average. And if you have one standard deviation, that means 68% of your samples will fall in either to the left or the right of the, av of the average listed there. Two standard deviations will be 95%. And this will be an important number when you ask, well, how much variation should I adjust for or allow for when I build my rations? A high standard deviation indicates that datas are, the data are spread over a wide, a wider range of values. And certainly you can think, for example, of dry matters and haylage. Uh, or a silage sample being quite variable depending on field variation, harvest variation, moisture uh, effects, exposure to uh, heat in the summer certainly can change those values around. A second one would be a co coefficient of variation. Uh, this is uh, has no met values or measures on it. It is a normalization measure of dispersion. And so it's what's the, the probability of the distribution curve. So again, gives you a bit of idea of how much of inherent variation without looking at it in terms of pounds or kilograms uh, or any weight units associated with it. So we're going to show you a couple of different examples. Very busy table in front of you here. 
And this looks, and watch the top of the chart, day-to-day variation on corn silage and hay crop on eight dairy farms in northeast Ohio. So again, you can take on, let's just pick on starch, for example. You can see on our starch numbers here, uh, on these uh, eight dairy farms, uh, day-to-day variation, the average is roughly 32% starch. Standard deviation are plus or minus three units, which means that uh, two-thirds of the sample are going to be anywhere from roughly 29 to about 34, 35. Here's your uh, coefficient of variation, about 10 percentage points. And the range you can see is 12, which means the highest value value was somewhere around 43, the lowest value somewhere around 29. Uh, the next shows the variation around these ranges. You'll see this pop up as well. And then uh, the Ohio people also listed the, uh, the, uh, the results from a very large data set from the Northeast from a forage testing lab. And now you can see, again, different values, different standard deviations, and different amounts of variation associated with it. You come down here and let's look at NDF. And we'll just look at averages. You can see there's no big surprise. Is the corn silage is lower in NDF than is the alfalfa haylage, but you can see actually standard deviation is a little bit bigger in the corn silage, and that surprised me just a little bit. I thought the haylage might be a little bit wider, and of course you can see the coefficient of variation is higher as well, and the range is about the same. Lots of information to look at, and so you can study this at your leisure to see kind of what variation you could expect when working in your part of the United States or in the world. Next, we look at day-to-day variation. I love this chart. Again, you can see this is uh, two different farms uh, across the top. And again, we'll look at corn silage on the left side. And you can see uh, here is your uh, uh, starch variation. You can see lots of variation in starch. A bit surprising to me. We don't know if these are coming out of bags or bunkers or uprights uh, at, uh, in terms of where this, these two farms are from. You can see the alfalfa. Some really big swings occur in dry matter. Uh, wide variation. Of course, that's going to be huge, especially if you're going through total mix rations where you are locking in the uh, amounts of feed on a wet basis. And so you can see quite a bit of variation listed there as well. Notice the protein surprising to me. Notice the protein is fairly constant here. Look at though there's one big drop here, but I'm not sure if the cows would actually see that hiccup in a total mixed ration. On this PowerPoint, a real take-home message, you can see under farms A and B, we looked at the blending of the two different forages. And you can see why there's lots of variation. When you get down to the TMR and you bring all the rest of the ingredients in, these are fairly consistent TMRs. You notice this one over here averaging somewhere in the mid-21, uh, 22, 23 range. We come over here to farm B, you can see slightly higher in the 25 or 26 range. So certainly this drives home the point that blending rations together, the two different forages along with other feedstuffs can really re- reduce the variation going on over this 15-day time period. Now we change, notice this goes from month-to-month changes on individual farms looking at the concentration, again, of the dry matter and the NDF looking at two, these forage sources. No big surprise, you can see compared to the 12- to 15-day variation, much bigger spikes, as you can see here on our NDFs, uh, a, a big increase over here on this farm. And again, you can see dry matters uh, varying. Uh, it's interesting how they tend to mirror and how they change. Come over here to legume silage. Again, on this uh, variation, you can see uh, uh, some real differences here in both, uh, both of those variables. So certainly over a 12-month period, more variations, which doesn't surprise us a great deal. And again, we're not sure which of these months would be occurring in terms of summer versus winter winter, which could be another important factor. Again, over this 12-month period, you've got that same chart. I'm not going to walk you through this. Again, you can study this. You can see, again, uh, if you want to look at uh, these d- different farms on corn silage or you want to look at legumes over here, you can see the protein and NDF values. Again, you have means, standard deviations, coefficient of variation in ranges, and again, list the number of farms as well. The next table shows, again, the uh, values for the ranges. Again, you can study those to see the variation on these farms. You can see different numbers of farms in this data set. And again, allows you to kind of study the data and try to come up with some uh, solutions or ideas here, which we will at the end of the discussion. 
Next, we look at some feeds that have very little variation. And so you can see we have corn grain, high moisture corn, distiller's grains. Here's the soybean meal from 18 different farms. And of course, I'm going to pick on that one there. You can see the dry matter, the standard deviation is very low. We would expect to see that. You can see uh, the uh, uh, coefficient of variation is also quite low. The range is quite low. And you can come over and look at proteins, uh, certainly quite a bit low, quite a bit lower the variation compared to, say, our legumes we had there earlier. And the Fs, of course, uh, are quite low because these concentrates are generally low in NDF, even though uh, you can see our, our coefficient of variation is a little higher because of the small the values of these various feeds. So again, shows that these feeds don't have near the variation that you and I would see uh, in the forages. Again, you can see the same data set looking at the means. So again, allows you to look at this and uh, decide and decipher how much variation occurring out there on those, on those situations. I thought I'd show this PowerPoint comes from New York State, simply shows a variation in a bunker silo. And this is dry matters that come uh, from a study out of the state of New York. And you can see, not a big surprise, uh, the dry matters vary. Uh, surprising though, dry matters, you can see in the top of the bunker is actually wetter than the, the dry matters that are on the bottom of, of the bunker. So as a result, variation. So again, if we could mix these at time of feeding, you can see getting uh, you could reduce variation rather than try to take them off at layers recognizing the variation that you'd have on the different layers. We look at two different devices uh, on the marketplace. Uh, this one is uh, coming from Italy, a uh, device in which you can actually put it in the box of your loading unit, and this will measure the dry matter or the moisture. So instantaneously as you scoop up the feed, put in the TMR mixer, you can check the dry matter. It will be reported here, and you can plug that into your computer and change the amount of feed that's going to be fed to the cows. A newer one that just came on the marketplace from Digistar is a handheld moisture tracker. You can see this uh, simply can track the feed very, very quickly. So again, you could do this, for example, on the face of your bunker or on your piles or as it's coming down the silo chute. So again, these newer techniques are going to be available for producers who want to reduce the moisture variation. Uh, the good news is some of these are going to also be able to check nutrients in the future. And so you'd be able to also adjust for variations, for example, in crude protein. NDF and starches, which would allow us to fine-tune our rations as well. Well, this is a lot of data to digest, to look at, to look go through. Let's look at some take-home messages from both Ohio State and some that we have added. Uh, Ohio State uh, researchers say certainly the amount of within farm variation is very specific, various feed ingredients, and you should consider this in testing. So you probably don't need to spend a lot of money testing soybean meal, but you probably want to stay on top of your, your, your homegrown forages and silages. Second, a, sim, a single samples should probably not be used. Ideally, a two or three week sample should be taken over a short period of time and be averaged. In fact, some of our testing labs provide that service for you and you can then plug that number into your ration formulation program. We already saw on the on-farm multiple sources of nutrients reduce variation. And in fact, the old thumb rule is you can put two or three pounds of about any feed ingredient into a TMR, and it probably isn't going to have a big impact on the TMR because it's, the, it's diluted out with the other ration ingredients on the farm. We saw that that blending of silages and feeds uh, after facing and before feeding could be a real plus on dairy farms. And we see this on some of our farms that take higher amounts off of these various storage type units. Certainly, monitoring dry matter on the farm is going to be important as it really impacts dry matter intake and nutrient concentration. So we had uh, some devices we saw, some fairly uh, uh, state-of-the-art electronic ones. Handheld moisture testers are available. Some of us on farms will use a microwave, a coster, or food dehydrator can be used as well. But certainly it's important when we start seeing uh, situations where we change sources of feed, we have moisture conditions such as rain or snow events that could affect the dry matter content of feed stored outside. And here comes the big one. When you're building rations, then what are you going to use? Our guideline is one standard deviation. So it says that you may want to protect your ration by adding one standard deviation. If you go back to the Ohio State data, you can see what the scope of that would be. For a starch, for example, you may want to stay on the low, want to be on, on the low side. In other words, be one standard deviation below the average you're putting in, especially if you're at high levels of starch in the ration, such as 27, 28, 29, or 30% starch. 
fibers, you may want to be on the high side. You want to protect the rumen against any rumen dysfunction. And so you may want to put one standard deviation on the, on the, on the NDF fibers just to protect the rumen. On protein, you may want to be spot on. Uh, proteins tend to be expensive, and you want to try to get as close as we can to the feeding program. Well, that concludes our program from today. Come and visit us at our YouTube channel. We have many other programs listed there. And throughout the year, we provide online dairy classes, and there is the uh, connection to come and visit us on classes. I want to thank, thank Jim Baltz, our instructional design specialist, who really helped put this whole program together. Thanks. Have a great day.